no doubt about it, shit is coming. And I'm just playing that bitch if you love it. Always told myself that this is the type of shit I wanted. I was being honest, even made a promise. Now we got everybody else, this was in the conscience. Talking to my fucking self, that's a little Hey, welcome everybody. It's been a long time since this video came out now. Five seasons of come and gone. A lot of people have asked me if they should change anything about the way that they've been playing. Luckily, Longbow hasn't had pretty much any changes at all. No major nerves to deal with. No real changes to their skills. So, I don't really think I need to. You just keep playing the way you're playing, and you'll be fine. Alright, all jokes aside, we got screwed, guys. We really did. Almost every individual thing about the class has been nerfed. I'm talking firing speed, trajectory, maximum range, the damage of the skills and the way that they are used, adding charge times and stamina to every attack, including regular left clicks, destroying both of the ultimate attacks, adding map changes specifically to counter longbows. You get the point. In general, I would say that the Longbow is a severely underperforming class by comparison. And it's something I would only really suggest adjusting for if you really just love playing the Longbow. Because most of your gameplay has to be tailored to fill in for all of your hero's shortcomings. And that goes all the way down to what units you're using and when you're using them. A great Longbow player can still be incredibly frustrating to play against, however and impact a win in a way that no other hero can. So with a lot to cover here, I'm going to be leaving as many timestamps down below as possible so you can navigate through what you may or may not already know. With the first part here dedicated to the new players, how to build and equip your hero, skills to use, how to get good gear early, etc. Of course, there will be details for a big giveaway below as well. Because I know this has been a highly requested video for a long time now. Finally, before I completely start, I want to just add a little bit of context to my opinions. A lot of you may not have been to my channel before this video. So, I'm a pure longbow player on Conqueror's Blade for a few years now. Since well before any Steam beta launch, I've seen all of the ups and downs for the class. I know why it's been nerfed as hard as it has. And I know why most players who are not longbows hate longbows. With that said, I don't think I'm the best player in the game, but I'm hoping that I'm qualified enough with my experience so far that I can help people get into a more balanced and team-oriented style of play with the class and showing how to be a frontline player like any other class when the time calls for it. And I welcome any feedback from players with tips or ideas that I might not have picked up on here, or if you just simply disagree with me. So let's get into it. The stat build for a longbow is now and has always been 100% agility. There are a ton of units that longbows generally don't need to be focusing on, which includes most melee units, and trying to balance out your stats as a longbow might feel like it makes sense very early game when a lot of that melee still has lower armor, but especially more recently, it's very, very easy and quick to get to some higher tier units, and so very quickly, Things like extra strength for penetration or extra survivability just become useless fast as the units around you get too strong for you to have a real impact anyways. Instead, I think a longbow should be played as a specialized role with a very specific job of controlling the enemy team's ability to pile up ranged units and get a critical mass in that regard. Now there is definitely a lot more that longbows can and should contribute as well. But this is the primary objective, and it should never be forgotten. Keeping your agility up 100% all the way to the end is what's going to allow you to effectively play this role all the way through until the end game without having to hit every single ranged unit multiple times to kill it as they continue getting stronger and stronger. Some very high value ranged units do require multiple hits, even with the best gear and the best stats, but we'll talk about that later on in the video as we get into how to choose your priority targets. Next up is going to be your build for your skills, and I'm going to detail each skill and how I use them 
the full builds I use, and why I honestly think varying off of these exact builds in any way is just flat out worse. Some of the skills are absolutely useless. The marksman skill, it actually used to be a pivotal part of my build when it granted a timed penetration bonus that could make the lightning bolt ultimate even more devastating. However, it was recently nerfed into a completely unusable skill, literally. The mechanics of it nullify its own use. And I'll explain what I mean. The marksman skill upon activation makes it so that your next arrow does not require a charge to fire at full strength. However, if you time it out, it's actually just faster to fully charge two arrows regularly than it is to activate the skill and then follow up with another arrow after that. It literally does nothing. And the sharp exit backflip escape is honestly just redundant. There's already a better escape skill for the longbow, and there's no reason to ever run two escapes. They go on the same cooldown anyways. The, there's no point to ever use two. And the bodkin skill does not give any bonuses to your piercing damage. It gives a bonus to slashing damage, which is never going to actually help you. I do actually switch to this skill for deathmatch and deathmatch alone because at least it helps my teammates pile down on a single hero a bit and helps them have a lower block break. But outside of that, its only use in Siege is to slightly boost penetration against one hero for a few seconds against slashing units. And you will very rarely find that opportunity. So the only minor skills that I use are one, Fire Arrow, which causes burning damage for a few seconds and cannot be blocked by units, but most importantly, dismounts an enemy hero from their horse. The actual application of that dismount is nearly endless. Dismounting a diving hero from getting to your squishy and valuable ranged units like Falcon Eddie Gunners, or preventing a low HP hero from being able to mount up and escape before your team finishes them, are very regular situations that I try to save the use of my fire arrow for. Second is the roll escape. For a long time, I did not want to subscribe to the need for an escape skill because I believe that going all damage skills for maximum DPS was the best thing to do at the time. But after the nerfs to all the longbow skills that require a built up charge instead of an instant fire, they don't actually increase DPS anymore or allow for faster shooting against weak targets. Now, they're really more specifically focused on the buffs and other benefits that they grant. Combine that with the actual damage reductions across the board for all the skills themselves, and it's just no longer worth it to run all damage skills. If they don't do the damage anymore, why bother? Also, unlike the backflip escape, which only lets you move backwards, the roll doubles as a mobility skill, as it sends you in whatever direction you're moving. While I do still miss the damage that the old pre-nerf build could do, adding the roll in has saved my life countless times, and I must say now that there's no reason not to use it. And third is the multi-shot, the only real high damage output skill outside of your ultimate. Used as often as possible, this is a multi-use skill that slowly adds up a lot of damage to melee units by the end of the match, or one that can deal very, very high damage to a single target from point-blank range. With 12 arrows and each averaging about 1k damage for headshots, it's very easy to throw it in repeatedly to big melee unit clashes, and while it usually won't actually be the thing that gets a lot of kills by itself, that 12k damage spread out through unit formations adds up quickly. It also helps me a lot in keeping my brace formation units in place. Usually a few units will make it around to their sides in combat, and being able to quickly kill one or two of those units on their side before they can really do much damage helps in keeping those formations alive a lot. But most importantly, it is half of your hardest hitting combo as a longbow. After using the exploding arrow ultimate close range on an enemy hero, they are knocked down and you have plenty of time to walk around and line up a devastating point-blank headshot with all 12 shots. This isn't enough on its own to one-hit a hero, but it is a great finisher for heroes that are already a little bit hurt. 
especially when seeing an exposed enemy hero in the open, it can be pretty easy to actually just mount up on your horse and chase them down, do a little bit of damage with your left clicks, and then immediately dismount once you're close range, use your ultimate, and follow up with the back shots to get the kill. Which brings us right into the ultimate skills. We've got the exploding arrow and the lightning shot. And while honestly both are viable, they're for very different reasons. First, with the lightning shot, if you're feeling really on with your aim, it can be so much fun to use, as your main priority mostly switches to killing heroes. A lightning bolt headshot will pack a hell of a punch, and being able to snipe heroes at important times like right on the point when they're behind their shields can be huge for taking a point, with the added effect that they lose control of their unit and you can often capitalize on the kill by getting a free wipe on a high value unit right after. Adopting this hero focused playstyle will also end up keeping you closer to the point and with your team, so you do have to consider the higher risk and keep your head on a swivel or you will get picked. And I'll have a few quick clips playing in the background here to kind of demonstrate the way I like to use it and just the power that it can hold when used right. The second ult is the exploding arrow and this is honestly the one I use 90% of the time. You can get some pretty great picks out of the lightning shot but most of the time the kills that you get will be ones that other melee heroes could have gotten as well while also being able to support their units on the front line. You saw a couple Pretty sweet double kill headshots there, but those types of situations are extremely rare and they're not reliable between matches at all. The exploding arrow gives you a lot more options for your play. It isn't as good as the lightning bolt as a standalone damage skill, but when comboed with the multi arrow like we talked about earlier, it does come close in that regard. But it also allows you to support your units with a good CC and knockdown to give them the advantage in a melee engagement. It is way more reliable for saving squishy units from a diving hero. And you often end up doing a lot more to help your team actually win when you capitalize repeatedly with it on ranged units to rack up the kills that your melee counterparts cannot help with. It's just a way more well-rounded and reliable skill that is guaranteed to find good use in every single match. And then lastly for our new players, I want to talk about gearing up your hero. I have had so many comments over time asking in my siege battles, why can't I do the same damage that you do even though I have the same stats and the same skills? And this is simply because I have better gear. The only good gear in the game is crafted gear, and crafted gear is made from one of three types of schematics. Uncommon, rare, and epic. While a lot of people think that only great gear comes from epic schematics, they would be wrong. To this day, the best bow that I use was rolled from a rare schematic, and even before then, I used an uncommon schematic to craft the bow I used for a long time before that. So if we go to the smith and we look down the list of weapons that we can create, in the uncommon section of each weapon, there are three options. The first two are absolutely useless and should never be crafted, even when you're such a low level that that's all you can use, because it's just a waste of materials. The third option, for us as longbows, this will be the volley, is still very viable. So let's try crafting each of these schematics to give a clear example. With the epic schematic, the Shenzhen bow, only epic or legendary tier bows can be crafted, but it's no guarantee. These schematics usually range around a million silver each and are incredibly rare to come by as in-game rewards. And this one here turned out terrible. Purple with slashing stats. That's more than a million silver down the drain right there. Next down the line are the rare schematics which are much, much more common as rewards, but do still cost a decent sum on the market, and they also require powdered silver, which is the most precious and sought after crafting material in the game. These schematics will be where you commonly look for a really good bow, and as we see here, this one turned out actually quite nice with purple rarity and very nice stat rolls. This isn't even far off from the best bow I use today. But very, very early on, these can still be quite hard to come by, 
especially when it might take any number of tries to get a good roll. The uncommon tier schematics, however, are very, very common as regular battle rewards and can be found quite cheap on the market regularly. They don't require any rare materials and can be hammered out in large number pretty easily, pretty early. And bam, just like that, we've got a good blue volley bow with excellent stat rolls for its tier, and this will make a great getting your foot in the door kind of bow while you build up your resources and schematics and move up a tier into the double recurves later on. Alright, so let's talk flow of the battle. Understanding the timing and flow of when things happen on each map is important to everyone wanting to learn the game, but this is especially true for us longbows, who are arguably the most vulnerable hero in any battle. However, with all the differences between maps, I usually like to break it down in the most basic way, which is just 1, the early game, 2, the mid game, and 3, the end game or home point. And I'm going to try and articulate my thought process on each of these three points as best as I can. The first part of every map, is going to be pretty basic. As a longbow, I do not use siege equipment because we have a job we can already be doing at range from the very start, whereas our melee counterparts have to spend a lot of time waiting around in the beginning, so I like to save the limited equipment for those players to use. I will sometimes push towers and rams, but only if my unit build allows for it. In almost no case is it worth it to place high value units on these types of equipment, so you can basically just say that if your build doesn't fit in serfs or other throwaway units, then just don't worry about it and keep them alive instead. Instead, my first immediate focus is moving my unit down to a safe area where it won't get hit by siege equipment, but is also close enough to be easily accessible when they are needed. No hiding my units 500 meters away in the back of the map and then waiting 3 minutes for them to walk over to me when I actually need them. I find the best way of doing this is to tuck them directly up against the walls closest to the objective, and this applies on both sides. On defense, places like staircases or walls near the point where they can't get trebbed are perfect, and on offense, just right pressed up against a good barricade or to the wall near where the ram will land so they are there when you're ready to move in. Now, with your unit safe, the next question is what early value can you gain for your team right off the start? And the best answer to that is usually to find the players who make the mistake of spawning ranged units first and leaving them exposed. Looking over the walls or climbing up an advancing siege tower gives a great vantage point to look around. Take all of the free range units that you can find for as long as they are exposed. Every dead archer or musket or falcon or flamethrower or whatever makes a difference later on. And later on in the video here, we will go over which of those range units to prioritize first when there are multiple targets available. However, if there are no free range units to hit off the start, then we need to look at what else can play a valuable role early, and this is where we start to see a bit of difference between attacking and defending. From the defensive side, you can immediately start taking free headshots on units that are pushing towers. Usually this is going to be serfs, martellatori, other various low level melee that you can kill in one shot with a headshot and the high ground bonus, but you don't want to focus down high tier melee and shield units just because you won't be able to kill them fast enough so that it actually causes a delay to the moving tower. So even though you are getting some kills on a more valuable unit, getting more kills on a lower tier unit is more efficient here because it also costs them the time of the towers being delayed. And you can often wipe out enough of the weaker units that the entire unit retreats and a new one has to come take their place. Killing fodder units like this also has the added effect that it takes away that player's ability to make safe plays where they can take big risks with low tier units on the flank and just kind of hail mary in the back. But after the fodder is lost, they can only take those risks with important units. 
On offense, there are two secondary targets that I like to focus on if no ranged units are available. The first is enemy siege equipment on the walls. There is nothing worse than losing your units for free to cannons or having to wait 10 minutes to breach the first wall because your towers get reset so many times. And it can be a little bit tedious, but it's a very easy play that is guaranteed to help your team in the early game. Simply running up close to the enemy walls below the angle that their siege can fire back and sit there and shoot up at the cannons until they break. It takes a good 20 shots or so to break a single piece. This isn't necessarily super important for every map, but certain ones like Harbor City or Algolia, where it is so easy to reset the towers literally until the end of the match, i just like to add that guarantee that we will get our towers across without too much time wasted. The second is as you're using your high ground to look for free targets, you should always try to keep a sense of where the momentum of your enemy is moving. Early game trebs are one of the biggest threats to a defending team, and being up high gives the unique perspective to be able to land perfect trebuchets, especially if you or your teammates are able to bait them out into horrible exposed positions on the wall. You can't always guarantee a nice blob like this though, but I do try to use my trebuchets early on so I have less things to focus on when I'm more exposed and on the front. Now. With the very early priorities covered, we can get into the meat of the first three sections of the battle, which starts as soon as the towers make it to the walls. There is always some degree of variance between maps, but again, I'm trying to lay a basic outline that you can work around to fit your situation. Essentially, Longbow is a support hero, so I make my choices around supporting a push or setting up an area for my team to push from so that I can support it. Create a foothold, support the push. Create a foothold, support the push. That's the game for us. So to start creating a foothold, we need to have a strong unit that can cover areas that our hero cannot. This is the main reason I like to start with Fortabrachio Pikes, Stalwarts, or other strong damage output brace units instead of shield walls to keep me safe. Sure, unshielded units are more exposed to ranged but that's what our hero is for. So we protect them from ranged, and they protect us from heroes and melee. If I use shields instead, any old mall class could just walk up to me and spin on me and my unit, and there is absolutely nothing I can do to stop them. Instead, with a brace unit, I'm able to keep the area in front of me clear, I'm able to focus my attention towards emptying the back line of enemy range, and creating a safe spot that I can look around from safely and retreat into if needed. And here's where I'll quickly interject with my list of ranged priorities. I'm using tier list here and some of the, some of the pictures heads got cut off but bear with me. So S class is only for falconetti gunners and flamethrowers with such low unit counts, low HP and armor and massive damage output Every single kill on this unit is high value and easy if they're visible. A class, both Imperial Archers and Imperial Archibusiers for being able to one hit with longbow while also having massive DPS output, only below S class because of the much higher unit counts. Rattan Marksmen because they are only Rattan Marksmen, because they are one of the only silver or above ranged units that are low enough HP to one hit every man in a maximum splash radius with your explosive arrow, which means that you can almost one hit the entire unit with a single shot. And lastly, Nomcons, just for their obnoxious bleeds. B class. Tercios and Kriegrats because they do have decent damage output, but they require a lot more than just one headshot to kill, and so they can be hard and annoying to focus down. Janissaries barely make it above C into B just because of their hero focus potential. And lastly, the Vassals, while being, in my opinion, one of the worst ranged units in the game, are still costly on leadership, and so that adds the value in killing them. C-Class, 
basically just a mix of every other low tier ranged unit in the game with the exception of the pavis which i have here because they can be impossibly frustrating to focus on because their hitboxes don't match up with their character models and their animations and so a lot of it is just a guessing game around whether their shield will block the shots or not if that alone was fixed they would be an s tier unit to focus and finally d class reserved just for javelins which are almost never worth it to shoot with a bow at all moving back into the match with our foothold established all that's left to do is be ready to support the team push as it comes in and it's important to have those different options available to you sometimes you'll be able to walk your brace into the clash do a bunch of damage brace to cut off the enemy from getting back into the point and get a pretty smooth capture other times they will be fortified with shields and mass range or siege equipment or any number of things that you might not be able to predict or be able to push with your first unit what my 40s might not be able to break into my imperial pike walk might be and what my pike walk can't walk into might be exposed to different angles for the imperial archers the rough outline only gets you so far and having different tools is going to let you solve most problems this is generally what we're trying to achieve and without turning this video which is already getting pretty long into a full-on unit guide onto how to push each different scenario with each unit we're going to move forward into the mid game once a is successfully taken whether we got our unit safely out after a or not is irrelevant always try to get your unit out when it makes sense of course but my build comes with three units because they are designed to allow for a unit to go down at each of the three stages if it is needed. The only thing I kind of hope to avoid is losing the archers first because they can just work some magic on home points, but nothing is really off the table. So moving in towards the mid game, this is when things get really dangerous, especially for longbows, as most of the mid game threats like cavalry or shock attack melee flanks are our biggest weaknesses. And this is basically what you're going to have to deal with. Without the right units, this can be really rough. And it's where a lot of longbows lose interest in the class. But the same basic principle still applies here as well. Create a foothold, support the push. It's just a lot harder to actually do that. Because instead of having your flanks safely secured on a one-way ramp, you're constantly a threat of being charged from all angles. This is again where unit choice and positioning are your only friends. In my opinion, in the current meta, you need to have units that can stop cavalry. So I like to use either Fortabracchio pikes or Imperial pikes, sometimes stalwarts, but there's not a lot of other units that I think currently fill this role as safely and consistently as these, at least for a longbow that can't assist them. And it's why I usually always bring two out of three of those so losing one of them on A doesn't just shut me down mid-game. Now, as for where to create your foothold, I think the logical way to go is usually to cut off as many of your flank angles as possible using the natural terrain and position where you can react in time to brace a flanking cavalry charge while also keeping your focus on opening up the enemy's back line and clearing out their ranged. Once you've created a small opening and your team starts to close in on the point, we're back in a support mode where we're just trying to use our brace or advance to close the grasp. But if you want your melee tanks to do their job and lead the way on the objective, then we've got to do our job and keep them safe. So in these cav heavy points, it's much more important to stop your team from getting flanked and wiped by cavalry than it is to stack into an already won fight on the flag. As soon as you see that you are not absolutely needed to take the flag, you want to be on flank patrol. My bikes are facing the rear. Okay, coming from... There, got as many of them as I could. That's most of them went, went down. Good. That was nice, bro. Well played, well played. Again, there will be times where the team just needs the damage more than anything else and risking your flanks to add on Imperial Volley Fire or Falcon Eddy Cannons can be a major deciding factor. But I never start with the risky play because it's, well, 
risky. Again, knowing when you'll need to switch to different options is something you'll just have to play and learn without this video getting way too long. These are just the tools I use and generally how I use them. Alright, so finally, moving into the home point. This is the moment that we build our game around. This is what we try to save our DPS unit for, if at all possible. Home point gets crazy. It's chaotic, siege equipment is everywhere, cav charge is cycling from both teams, giant stacks of ranged, etc. And a lot of time, it's a very slow and tedious poke and prod to find where the enemy's weakness is on either team until somebody goes all in and the entire game ends with one big clash. If we still have our DPS unit at this point, then we're not here to do that poking and prodding for our team. Of course, always take the ranged units when they're free, but for your DPS unit, it is all about keeping them alive. And I will even tell my unit to run away and straight up sacrifice my hero if it keeps the unit alive and lets me push with them again. This is where I'm paying extra close attention to the map and pinging any flank movements and waiting to move in the second our melee makes their advance. You will not be able to buy any ground by yourself like this, so it is extremely important that you are right on your team's ass, up close, as they move in, so you can take advantage of your damage and start wiping out heroes. I have had so many matches where this last one or two minutes nets me as many kills as the previous 15 minutes building up to it. But like every other point in the map, this is a well-rounded build that is meant to deal with adversity, so this is only what is considered ideal. If things don't go as planned and you had to sack your DPS unit early game, then that's why we come with interchangeable units that can always have an impact. Even on home point against the toughest defenses, you can still be a squishy longbow and get on the front line with your team. And knowing which little corners and nooks people like to hide in on each map are always different, but if you know where the critical areas are, then you can always clear a hole for your team like before, or hold off the resupply lanes. What really loses a lot of games for people at these stages is honestly fear or greed not wanting to lose your own units or wanting other people to lead the way first and take the losses so you can get all the kills. Now, I don't like playing like that, but I get it, and I'm not going to hate you for it. But I think it's better to try and lead the way, and then you can be pissed later if nobody followed you in. At least that way, nobody can ever say that you're that cuck longbow who just hid in the back all game and did nothing to help. If you want to get the most wins, you gotta just be willing to go balls in, put your bronze on the line. Whew, alright. This has definitely been my longest and definitely the most time consuming guide I've ever put together. So I'm hoping you guys enjoyed it, maybe learned a few things too. As I mentioned at the start, there will be a large giveaway for this one, and all that you need to do to enter is to like the video, be subscribed to the channel, and leave me a comment below just telling me if you enjoyed this much, much longer guide. You're free to tell me that you hated it and that still counts. I just want to get a good feel for the type of video lengths that you guys prefer. So, thanks so much for checking it out. And until next time, have a good one. Take care. Oh, that is a huge grab, dude. Oh, no.